Broadcasting from the KMF Collective Studio, it's time for the Keep Moving Forward podcast. Join us every week as we dive into the stories of remarkable current and former athletes that have transitioned into the real world. Now here's your host, Katie Galley. everyone, and welcome to the 204th episode of the Keep Moving Forward podcast. I'm your host, Katie Galley. Today in the KMF Collective Studio, I have with me retired professional rock climber, Tori Allen. How are you doing, Tori? Hi, I'm doing good. Thanks for having me. Absolutely. Thank you so much for stopping by and sharing your story with us today. Yes. <laughs> well, I'm excited to dive in, Tori. And so just to kind of... Um, Get to know you a little bit. I wonder, where did you grow up and how, if at all, was your childhood shaped by athletics? Well, I actually grew up in West Africa. Um, My parents were missionaries, so we moved overseas when I was three years old. And I had a pet monkey when we lived in West Africa. and I followed Georgie around everywhere. So you could say that from the earliest of days, I was born to climb with my pet monkey. (laughs) That's so cool. I mean, that's such a unique childhood. One, I mean, to grow up in West Africa and then two, to have a pet monkey and learn how to climb from that pet monkey. And so, um, Tori, do you have any, um, were you born in West Africa? Were you born in the U.S. and then moved to um, West Africa? What was that childhood transition like? I was born in Auburn, Alabama, while my parents were in college, and they just felt called to the missions field. And so after my brother was born, we moved over to France first in 1992, and my parents went to language school there, and then we moved to West Africa for five years. And um, so I just, you know, was homeschooled and grew up in a small village. We had no electricity, no running water, just a very simple life. But sometimes the simplest life brings out... (laughs) the best in us, I think. Mm-hmm. Um, so when we got Georgie, actually, the the village people had seen the mother monkey in their crops. And so they had shot it because it was eating their food. Mm-hmm. And then when they went to go get the monkey, there was Georgie, the baby monkey attached to her. And we were the only American family in the village. So they brought the baby monkey to us and sold it to my parents for five dollars and of course my brother and I were like yes yes we want a pet monkey (laughs) but she was only about a week old and we bottle fed her and kept her alive and it was pretty incredible (laughs) wow I mean that's amazing it's such a unique a unique childhood and then two um to be influenced by it, it's cool. I mean, you can have idols and people you look up to in the professional sporting world or in any world, but then to have um, kind of your first introduction into rock climbing into what would become a profession for you by a little baby monkey. That's yeah, that's so cool. <laughs> so then we moved. We moved back to the states when I was nine. Okay, and um, I I didn't really get into sports much yet. And then when I was ten years old, we were shopping at a mall. And you know how they have a climbing wall in a mall, mm-hmm. you know, sometimes? So I, they had one at this store called Galleons. It was like a sporting goods store. And so I climbed the wall, and I went all the way to the top, and the people who work there were like, wow, your daughter's really good at this. You should get her into climbing. And my dad was like, oh, you just want us to buy stuff at your store. <laughs> like, they thought they were just trying to pull one over on him. So it was free to climb the wall. So every day for a week – my parents brought me back to the mall and I climbed the wall. And finally the people who worked there were like, there's an indoor rock climbing gym down the road. Take her to the gym. You don't have to bring her to the mall every day. (laughs) (laughs) And so we went to the climbing gym and then the people who worked at the climbing gym were like, your daughter is really good at this. You should put her in competitions. And three months later, I won junior nationals. Wow. And so my parents were like, oh, maybe she is kind of good at this. <laughs> <laughs> Man. So it was a very natural sport for me. Yeah. I mean, it, it seems that way. And so then Tori, I mean, you said at nine, 10 years old, that you, that was your first time um, climbing that rock wall in the mall. Um, what made you decide? I mean, did you just want to do it? Did, were you, did you have this passion for climbing things? Why? I guess it's because it's kind of not, um, it's a unique sport to fall into the world of climbing, it seems. So how did you kind of mentally at that age um, feel about getting into this this world? It was, it, it was so natural. When I started climbing, it was like everything in the world disappeared and it was just me and the wall. And I just felt like that's what I was supposed to do. I just loved it. And I guess I always say, you know, I played soccer as a kid, you know, in the summer leagues. 
And I hated going to soccer practice, but I liked games. I liked, I'm competitive by nature. So I liked competition. Well, climbing was the only sport I ever did where I liked practicing it just as much as I liked competing. Mm. So that's when you know this is what I'm supposed to do if you enjoy practice. <laughs> yeah, absolutely. That's a good point because it's it's easy to get. Um, you love the thrive and the thrill of competition, but then it's the practice. It's that grunt work that you have to put in every single day to, in order to get to those games. So it's important to find the love um, in the practice times. Of course, knowing that not you're not going to love it every single day. Sometimes it's going to be a challenge to go to practice, but it's like you said, most days, almost every day, you love you love what you do and you love getting out there. Exactly. Yep. So Tori, I mean, from that time, fast forward, when you, you won junior nationals just three months into getting into rock climbing, um, how did that kind of set the stage for you? Looking forward, did you start to think, okay, I want to do something with rock climbing. I want to become a professional rock climber. Or was it really just at that, at that age that you were at, um, just purely going out of a love for it and kind of relying on your parents for help and guidance as far as where to go on this rock climbing trajectory? Yeah, it was kind of a, an adventure for everyone. Obviously, my parents weren't climbers and knew nothing about the sport. Right. Um, at the time, the climbing gym, we lived in Indianapolis, Indiana, so there's obviously not outdoor rocks to climb. Hmm. So there was one climbing gym in the city, and, and I trained there, and it was kind of going downhill. So after about a year and a half of training there, the gym went up for sale, and my parents actually bought it. <laughs> Uh, because, well, if the gym had gone out of business, my career would have just been done. There was no climbing gym in the rest of the state at the time. Wow. And so, um, yep, they just took out a loan and bought me a climbing gym. Wow. <laughs> so it was pretty neat. And then at that point, we, as a family, started to um, redo the gym and and get some some better training facilities going there for for me and then my mom actually started a climbing club so we had other youth involved and it really took off um i kept doing junior competitions i was undefeated in the junior circuit until i was 12 and then when i was 12 years old was the first time i entered my first adult competition and i competed qualified for adult nationals and then i placed second place at adult nationals when i was 12. So that was uh, that was when I became a professional athlete because at that point I was becoming paid to climb. Mm -hmm. So that's when they defined it as being a professional. Yeah. And so at that time, Tori, I mean, becoming a pro athlete at 12 years old, were you still being, I mean, and your parents buying the rock climbing gym um, so that you could continue to pursue this passion, which is so incredible. And then having your whole family get involved with <laughs> yeah. it and help out. I mean, that's just, that's support to the max. I mean, that's so cool yeah. that you had that. And so um, one, were you still being homeschooled at that time? And two, along with your professional rock climbing career, as it took off, um, did you have any hand in um, learning how to run the rock climbing business or learning how to run the gym too I I thought I had a hand in running the gym I mean my dad <laughs> handled my dad handled the important things but I helped right. with ordering the holds and you know hiring route setters and things like that that was the fun part of it um, also at the same time so I was homeschooled until I was 12 years old then I actually started participating in another sport pole vaulting Wow um, I saw pole vaulting on the Olympics and I said, I want to do that. That looks dangerous. <laughs> <laughs> and so I wanted to do pole vaulting. Well, at the time in Indiana, and I think probably the United States, homeschoolers weren't allowed to participate in high school sports. You had to be enrolled in school. Now homeschoolers can because of Tim Tebow, but at the time you couldn't. So I had never been to public school, so I had to take a standardized test to see what grade I should go into. So at 12 years old, I took a standardized test and I tested into ninth grade. Hmm. Well, <laughs> my parents didn't know that they shouldn't send me to high school at that age. So I turned 13 in July and started high school in August. Wow. And I was obviously very young for my grade. Um, but I went to a public inner city high school in Indianapolis called Lawrence Central. And I was on the track team there participating in pole vaulting as well as continuing to train as a professional rock climber. So then my life got really busy. Yeah. 
I can imagine. <laughs> and I mean, I, that's so cool. I mean, seeing seeing something like pole vaulting on TV and thinking, okay, this is now I want to try this too. And I mean, it's similar to rock climbing in the sense of that fearlessness. You have to be able to get over that bar um, and clear that height and, and uh, just kind of have that n- no fear and going after it. And so Tori, I mean, when you, um, like you said, your life got really busy at that point, balancing professional um, rock climbing as well as competing in a high school track team and then now going to um, public school so then how did you start to navigate all of that and what was that transition like for you one into public school and two starting to compete in two different sports well you could say I was a little bit sheltered as a homeschooled preacher's daughter you know (laughs) and so it was a culture shock going to public school from just it was a school with 2,000 students to um the you know, the structure of school, being homeschooled, there's a little more flexibility. Um, Then I was so far behind as far as maturity goes (laughs) with where the public school students were at and where I was at, you know. Um, So there was some awkwardness there. I didn't have a huge group of friends. I missed a lot of school, so that didn't help. You know, everyone goes from middle school with their group of friends into high school. And so being thrown in and being that weirdo (laughs) that it was a struggle. I would say high school was not the best time of my life, but (laughs) I got through it. Um, Another thing that was unique about my experience pole vaulting was I was on the boys track team because in the state of Indiana at the time, pole vaulting was not a female sport. Really? So there was still um, Indiana, Utah were the last two states that didn't have girls pole vaulting. And so well, my family and I learned about Title IX, and so they had to allow me to participate in pole vaulting and compete on the boys' track team against the boys because of Title IX. Well, I ended up winning Freshman County <laughs> against the boys. <laughs> there was 24 of us at Freshman County, 23 boys and me, and I won. And only one of them continued to pole vault after that year. Wow. The rest of them quit, <laughs> which is kind of funny. Yeah. <laughs> but then we we took it to the next level of not just me part- participating on the boys track team, because if I wanted to gain a college scholarship of any kind, colleges weren't going to look in the boys roster for a female pole vaulter to recruit. Mm. So we actually filed a Title IX lawsuit against the state of Indiana And it took three and a half years before I could compete at the state level on the girls track team against girls. But we won before I graduated. So my senior year, I got to participate on the girls track team at the state level. And there was girls pole vaulting in the state of Indiana. So that was a huge success for for the sport and for the (laughs) state. And just for me personally, it was really neat to learn about Um, We went to Washington and lobbied and did things like that that were very, very neat to learn about. Mm -hmm. Um, And obviously, I'm passionate Uh about Title IX. (laughs) Right, right. That's so cool. I mean, and it's amazing that you were at that age in high school, you were able to be a part of that, something so instrumental and monumental to happen in the state that you were growing up in and um, being at the, I mean, being able to compete then at this event that you loved um, so that you could have this chance to go on and compete in college. And so then Tori, looking forward then after this incredible success with Title IX and being able to compete um, uh, with a women's team for a pole vault um, in high school, um, did you start to look for or start to get acknowledged with uh, college scholarships looking forward for track and field? Or did you start to think, okay, how did your, also with your rock climbing career, um, was that going to have to go on the back burner while you went to college? Um, What was the next phase looking like for you? Well, it all, it all overlapped a lot. So Mm -hmm. while I was in high school, I was now training for the X Games, winning the X Games. And then my career in climbing took off Mm -hmm. with interviews and competitions and things like that. So I graduated high school when I was 16, and in order to participate in World Cup rock climbing events, I had to be 16. Mm. Well, now I was also being recruited by colleges to get a pole vaulting scholarship. So when I was graduating high school at 16 years old, I had to decide whether I wanted to pursue my career in rock climbing Mm. or I wanted to pursue my career in pole vaulting and essentially a college degree. My parents didn't have a lot of money. I wasn't in a position to take out a bunch of debt. So 
a scholarship was very attractive for me to get that college degree. Without it, I may not be able to, you know, so yeah. that was a whole nother factor in it. And so really, I had to choose between climbing in my education. And at that point, I chose my education and I took a pole vaulting scholarship to Florida State University. Mm -hmm. um, and then because, <laughs> because of how scholarships work, I was sponsored by Nike for rock climbing. Well, Florida State is sponsored by Nike for their athletics. Now that was a conflict of interest. So I had to drop all of my climbing sponsors in order to accept an NCAA scholarship. Wow. I couldn't continue to be a professional. I could continue to compete, but in climbing competitions, when you win, you win prize money. Mm -hmm. So that would be against NCAA terms, even though it's a different sport. Right. So I would have to pay my own way to competitions and then I'd have to decline the prize money if I wanted to continue climbing. Mm. So to me, it, it wasn't going to work. I couldn't do both. I couldn't do college pole vaulting and climbing. And so that's where I, I essentially let climbing go. Wow. Um, and it was the hardest decision I ever had to make. Yeah. I still look back and think, what if, yeah, you know, <laughs> right, absolutely. And it, it would be impossible not to. I mean, rock climbing was such a huge part of your life. It was something you truly excelled at at such a young age. And I mean, it was instrumental in your growing up um, in West Africa and with your with your monkey, Georgie. I mean, it goes back to the roots and it's easy to yeah. get your identity wrapped up in that. Like I am a rock climber and independent of that. Of course, you were an incredible pole vaulter being able to get a scholarship to go to the next level at the, at, for college, but having to let go of something so important to you and pursue of that. And so Tori, I mean, even though you were taking on this brand new incredible challenge of accepting an NCAA scholarship and competing at a division one program um, for pole vaulting in the midst of that transition and even going forward to competing in college, um, how challenging was that transition? How challenging was it to let go of rock climbing, even though you were accepting that new challenge? It was, it was really hard. It was, it was like going through a really hard breakup. <laughs> yeah. Um, and then, and then even in, in call in Florida, there wasn't very much rock climbing. So I picked another state. <laughs> I didn't have many rocks, <laughs> which is kind of funny, <laughs> but, um, you know, even, even now climbing is one of those things that when I go climb, I just feel free and I can still do it as a hobby. And it's, it's not, pole vaulting isn't one of those sports that you just go pick up a pole and do. It's very dangerous right. if you don't have the right training. Climbing is one of those sports. If you're a mom or a kid or whatever point you are in your life, you can go climb. Mm. You know, there's always different routes that you can do. And so that's really special about that sport to me. Yeah. Um, and so, yeah, just <laughs> I always look back at that moment and think, you know, now they they just had the qualifiers for the 2020 Olympics and rock climbing's in the Olympics, going to be in the Olympics this year. And mm. I just think, man, would I, would I still be training? Would I have, is that something I would have pursued? You know, yeah. I don't know. I mean, again, you're right. It's impossible to not think about that. I mean, something as monumental, again, as becoming now an Olympic sport um, and pursuing that. And you're right. I mean, it's something, if you think about it, um, you could go out. I mean, rock climbing is, it lends itself, like you said, if it outside, inside, you have indoor facilities outside. If you have rocks, you can climb them. But pole vaulting is such a technique driven sport. You can't just pick up one of those fiberglass poles and jump over <laughs> a, um, a pole. Yeah. It's, not, uh, it's not super safe if you don't know the proper technique. Um, and so, yeah, like you're saying, reflecting back, it's thinking about those what ifs. And of course, being confident that you, uh, you chose that path of going pole vaulting and seeing how far you could take it. Um, but not without the challenges of having to let go of the, your rock climbing career at that time. And so Tori, then mm -hmm. um, p looking forward into your collegiate profe uh, your collegiate career with pole vaulting, um, do you have a most memorable meet or anything that really sticks out to you um, within, uh, within the confines of that, uh, that career that you had? Um, for me, how, how high I jumped or what place I placed wasn't necessarily the most important thing. Mm -hmm. My parents always told me, win or lose today, you don't cry. We're mm -hmm. proud of you. I always called it the talk. You know, oh, they're going to give me the talk again. Win <laughs> or lose, we still love you. You have to be a good sport and no crying and all this, you know. But pole vaulting in college, yes, I made it to that level. I was not the best. The highest I ever placed was third in the ACC, which was awesome. That was huge for me. 
but even that meet, <laughs> I almost think I got lucky. Mm -hmm. Like some of the other girls who were better than me just didn't have their best day that day. Mm -hmm. So it wasn't that I was the third best in the ACC. <laughs> you know what I mean? <laughs> I'm realistic about that. Mm -hmm. I think as a whole, the amount of leadership opportunity that I was given, um, I got to represent Florida State University at the leadership conference at Disney World. Wow. I was chosen by the coaching staff out of all of the sports. I was chosen to represent the sports, the sports department of Florida State. That was a huge honor for me. Um, and getting to go to different leadership things like that, I think have have sorry, that's my dog. No, you're fine. You're fine. <laughs> have led to um, led to me not regretting that decision, knowing that choosing your education is the most important. And I will teach my kids that, that, you know, people can take a, a medal isn't going to get you anything, but your education is everything mm. um, and, and leadership opportunities and um, growth like that is so much more important than a medal. <laughs> yeah. And I mean, and that makes a lot of sense. And Tori, like you're saying, you, um, the whole reason you decided to, um, to stop rock climbing was so that you could pursue this education. It was so much more than just getting a scholarship for pole vault. It was the scholarship for a sport that allowed you the opportunity to get that education um, at 16 years old. And so for you then, yeah. Tori, um, in pursuit of that education, what major were you or what degree were you pursuing um, looking for, looking after your um, four years at the NCAA level? Well, I, I actually pursued something I was very passionate about, and I got a degree in fashion design and merchandising. Mm. Um, I'm a, I've always loved sewing and designing and creating and, and being a seamstress. I never wanted to move to New York or do something like <laughs> that. I always thought, what if I could design for Nike or the North Face? Or yeah. that, that was attractive to me. Um, that opportunity hasn't yet fallen in my lap, but I'm not giving up on my dream. Right. <laughs> and I still... I still sew and create. Right now, actually, I do a lot of wedding dresses, bridesmaids dresses, that sort of thing, which is great, a great side business. Yeah. Um, but, yeah, so I pursued fashion design. <laughs> and so, I mean, and that is really cool. I, I love that. You pursued something that um, – it was unrelated to sports, really. I mean, it was just something, like yeah. you said, it'd be cool to work for North Face or Nike and design clothes or design shoes for them, but um, that wasn't the primary driving force. It was just another side passion that you had, and like you said, you turned that into a side hustle, and so, um, Tori, yeah. looking upon graduating college and pursuing that degree in fashion merchandising, and now here, where you are today, um, with this side hustle, do you envision it one day maybe becoming a full-fledged business, not just your side hustle? Um, and also, how does it work? Do you uh, market yourself on Diva website? Do you market yourself on platforms to try and get the word out about the fact that you primarily make wedding dresses, bridesmaids dresses? How does that um, side hustle work? Um, right now, it's just I have a Facebook page. I call it So Tori, S E W, because yeah, get it sewing. I like so it. Tory. <laughs> <laughs> and um, and I do, yeah, I do custom designs and. Word of mouth spreads quickly, and so I'm kind of doing that. I haven't really jumped into the Etsy thing yet. I've looked into it, but I feel like you have to have so much inventory, and that's overwhelming for me right now. Mm -hmm. Yeah. <laughs> um, but it's, like I said, it's something that can slowly grow, and and it's not something I've given up on. If anything, it's something I just keep pursuing. Um, yeah. As it, as it presents itself, opportunities present themselves. Absolutely. So that's really cool, yeah. Tori. I love that, that you created this side hustle for yourself. And so then um, in between now, so like now where you are today with your family and, um, and w pursuing this side hustle and the time then you graduated college and so had this degree, completed your NCAA career, um, how did you navigate then that tra transition? So you'd already hung up um, rock climbing and uh, navigated that transition and now again having to go through another transition of, okay, I'm no longer a pole vaulter. Um, so now it's going forward in not just – Re releasing or letting go of a certain sport it's releasing the fact that letting go of organized athletics um as it was in your life and so how did you navigate that going into the next phase of your life that was definitely a whole nother transition yeah. I feel like by the time I was done pole vaulting in college I was pretty burnt out mm -hmm. I mean the the level that you train at for a college sport is is intense 
and it's year round. Mm -hmm. <laughs> so I feel like as far as fitness wise, I was pretty burnt out and I took a couple years off of really, I mean, I, I exercise, go for a run, but any sort of weightlifting or training, it was nice to have a break since I had been doing it since I was 10. Yeah. <laughs> you know, <laughs> I had been training at a very high level for a very long time for someone my age, you know? Yeah. And so taking a break from sports felt good at first. And then, and then I missed it a lot. And I actually, I moved to Steamboat Springs, Colorado after college and I joined a women's rugby team. Really? And that, <laughs> and that was so cool. <laughs> and it just was another sport and it was competitive and fun. And we trained pretty hard. I mean, we were a club sport, but it just shows that when you're an athlete, it, it's always a part of your life, even if it's a club sport of rugby as you get older or something like that. Yeah. Um, so I feel, I mean, sports will always be a part of my life. I'm sure there's a new sport I haven't even tried yet that I will someday <laughs> that I don't even know. <laughs> right. You're so right. And I mean, I think like you said, it's, it's always going to be a part of your life when you're a competitor. It's just that inner thing that's always there. And so constantly looking for something to satisfy that competitive drive. Knowing, yeah. of course, that you are, you were, like you've learned over the time, knowing that you're more than the athlete that you were, but it's just something that's always going to be a part of you. And so, Tori, I mean, that's amazing. You moving to Colorado, <laughs> um, joining a rugby club. Uh, what really prompted, was the, the idea to move to Colorado in pursuit of joining that women's rugby club? Why did you move to Colorado in the first place? I, I graduated college in 2009 and the economy was pretty terrible. So um, I could kind of just move anywhere, I suppose. And I had some family in Colorado, so I had a place to land until I got my feet under me. Uh, my aunt and uncle lived out there. And so, um, yeah, I just thought, you know, we've always vacationed in Colorado. I'm just going to go for it. <laughs> so I loaded up my car and drove out there. And when I got there and mom and dad weren't paying for the condo, it wasn't quite like I remembered on vacation. <laughs> <laughs> I was like, oh, I've got to figure this out. <laughs> but um, I did. I figured it out. I got a job at a law firm as a paralegal and, and you know, made ends meet. And that's, that's when I met one of the attorneys was um, the one starting the rugby club. So that's how I got involved in the club. And um got to do that and I also joined a dance team in Steamboat an adult dance team and wow <laughs> it was <laughs> just another sport <laughs> and um, obviously I snowboard so did that all winter long and <laughs> yeah I loved Colorado I lived there for seven years wow and then now I live in Minnesota northwest Minnesota and what brought you to oh. Minnesota I met my husband and he's a farmer here so wow this is a Another side story, but we met on a reality TV show in Sweden. <laughs> really? <Yeah. laughs> it's not a joke. Wow. Wait, so you were also at one point, you were in Sweden. Yeah. Well, so it's a reality TV show called All for Sweden, and they take Americans with Swedish ancestry, and they film you learning about Swedish culture and learning about your heritage. Hmm. And so this was in 2000. Uh, 17. So 4,000 Americans applied for the TV show and 10 were chosen. So, you know, you went through different steps. You went to LA, met with producers. So I made it through all of the interview processes and was chosen to go to Sweden for this reality TV show. And my husband, Nathan, he also applied for it and made it through all the steps. So we met in Sweden when we were filming. Wow. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> And it's not a dating show at all. Right, right. It's not supposed to happen. <laughs> but, Gosh. Yep. That's amazing. So we amazing. filmed in Sweden for almost six weeks of filming mm -hmm. and um, pretty intense. I mean, reality TV shows in Sweden are not like in America. They're very, very, I don't know, laid back, I guess. Not dramatic. Gotcha. But, <laughs> um, it was a super neat experience and... Um, and then, yeah, so then when the show finished airing, my lease was up in Colorado, and I just took another chance and moved to Minnesota. 
<laughs> and we got married. <laughs> wow. I love yep. that. That's such a, I mean, again, like your life is just a, one big unique story. Everything that you've done is <laughs> yes. so interesting. And so Tori, I mean, that's crazy that you guys met on this reality Swedish TV show. And then you said 4,000 people applied, only 10 were selected. What prompted you to apply in the first place for the show? Well, mostly my mom. My mom is always she she's my mom so she thinks I'm like the cutest greatest thing ever you know of course because <laughs> she's my mom <laughs> so she's always said oh you should be on a reality tv show someday you should do it you should do it and I'm like oh mom whatever you know <laughs> so she sends me this link to this one and she's like this is the one I just know it this is the one and I'm like mom I do not have time for this I was working a long shift that day and I had a small break and she's like, okay, I will do the application for you. You just make the two minute video and just send it to me. So literally she filled out the application as if she was me. <laughs> and then I made the video and then that got me through the first round. Wow. And I was like, oh my gosh, my mom. <laughs> but <laughs> she did a good job, I suppose. <laughs> right, right. <laughs> Man, yeah. that's so funny. And again, you're just having your family support you <laughs> unrelentingly, just like always there, you yeah. know, filling out your TV show application for you. That's so cool. I mean, I love, I love hearing that. Um, yeah. and so then Tori, after that, so meeting your, your to be husband and then saying, okay, I'm going to take another chance, move to Minnesota, um, and then start a life here with my, with my new husband. And so looking forward, um, again, navigating that next transition. And I wonder Tori too, I mean, um, I imagine you look uh, just with all these different steps, like you said, you sometimes do think back to your rock climbing days and how, because that was such an impactful, huge part of your life. Um, after you did graduate college and moving forward into all these next steps, were there still opportunities coming up as far as maybe sponsorship or public speaking roles um, or anything coming out of the fact that you had dedicated so much of your life to professional rock climbing? Absolutely. I have done even as recent as a couple of months ago, done um, motivational speaking at schools. That's where I really, I feel like I really connect with that middle school, high school age generation. Yeah. Um, especially because high school was so challenging for me that, you know, when I, when I talk about the challenges and the bullying and the, the balancing that part of my life, I feel like I can connect with a lot of kids going through similar issues, not, not being professional athletes, but just the balance of life and bullying and things like that. Um, so I do still to this day do public speaking, um, at mostly schools. I've done, I've done some corporate events, mm -hmm. um, when, when they are interested in, you know, a motivational type talk. Um, and yeah, I mean, I've done even, I can't remember how recent, but I've even done some TV shows like More Than Human, um, and I did one for, uh, what what network was it? They had me race uh, up a wall against a guy that invented a vacuum that could climb a wall. <laughs> trying to think of what it was called. It was so ridiculous. Mm -hmm. Sometimes you get calls from these producers and they have this idea for a show and you're like that sounds ridiculous but you want to pay me sure let's <laughs> yeah, right, go for it right. <laughs> <laughs> I will race your vacuum yes exactly <laughs> exactly that's so funny and I mean yeah. it's amazing though too that it keeps rock climbing um in your life it keeps paying off again and again like you said it's the uh monetary opportunities that come up but then it's still it's just they were allowed to come up because you dove all in at such a young age into a sport that you loved something that made you feel free and still does make you feel free and so that it keeps kind of giving back to you um because you gave so much to it, it is it is really cool um and so Tori now I mean doing these opportunities as they come up working with um your so Tori which is I, I so yeah. I love that and developing that on the side. Um, so what else do you have going on now? I know for listeners, for you guys don't know, two weeks ago, I think it was me and Tori had our interview scheduled and I texted her and she's like, hey, like, can we reschedule? I just had my baby. And then she like, just pops a kid out and now she's ready to go uh, for this interview. So it's really, really cool. So yeah, Tori, what's uh, what's going on in your life now? Um, now I have two kids, uh, a newborn little girl and a 17 month old little boy. Wow. And they keep me very busy. Yeah. I also, um, I coach track and field now. So in the spring here in about March, I'll start um, 
preseason with the girls. So I'm the head track coach at the school here. So that's another way that track has stayed in my life. Yeah. Um, and then I'm co- currently coaching figure skating. So I, I stay in, in the sports through coaching now. I tell the girls, when they win, I only take 80% of the credit. So, <laughs> they think that's funny. I love that. How did you, I mean, track and field, of course, it makes sense. It's a natural step um, to get into because of pole vaulting, but figure skating, how did you become a coach of that sport? Well, it was a, I figure skated as a kid just very briefly for less than a year. And it was a sport I always loved, just being girly and the costumes. I <laughs> like that. Yeah. But um, it was just a need that came up here in, in, in the small town we live in, Halloc. There's not a lot of people that are willing to coach. So it came up and I said, I'll do it. And I just took it on and, and I've really loved it. I've got 70 girls in the program this year. Wow. So, and I'm the only coach. <laughs> so Man. it's a lot, but it's wow. really fun. Yeah. And I mean, it kept me really active my whole pregnancy. So. That's good. That's, that was good. <laughs> yeah, staying moving. That's so cool. Yep. I mean, that these opportunities yeah. come up. One, I mean, they're presented to you, but two, it's a matter of saying yes to them. You have to choose to say yes to them, and you do. I mean, being able to help these young athletes, um, like you said, it's it's something, think, athletics was so important to you um, growing up, so now you get to impart that knowledge and those experiences that you had um, on so many athletes across different sports, too, which is so amazing, from rock climbing to track and field to figure skating, um, yes. just getting diving all in here and so Tori I mean um, one reflecting back on this truly incredible and unique and remarkable life that you've led and looking forward knowing that you are impacting and are going to continue to impact so many more people Um, I just have one final question that I ask all of my interviewees what do you want to be remembered for I hope that people remember me for positive attitude Um, just as as an athlete as a person my outlook on life is not about winning. It's about leaving behind something positive, something positive for the sport, something positive as a coach, you know, impacting those athletes in a positive way. Um, So I think that if people could just remember me as a positive person that wanted only good things for sports and especially for women in sports. Thank you all for tuning in. I hope you enjoyed today's episode. To learn more about our guests, check out the show notes at keepmovingforward.us. While you're there, go ahead and subscribe to our newsletter to stay up to date on all things coming out of the KMF Collective Studio. Always remember, you can beat the odds and go the distance. If only you keep moving forward.